What's up, guys? It's DDP. Yes, yes, I am here. Thank you for your applause. It is not necessary, I assure you. Seriously, cut the applause. Just, just cut it. <laughs> All right, so uh, here's an edition of Big 12 Football Roundup. I didn't really think I would end up having to do, admittedly. But you know what? When a player from the Big 12 Conference wins the Heisman Trophy for the second straight year, you got you to gotta talk about it, especially if this is the kind of show you do. So let's get right to it. As you can see, obviously, you know by now. And if you didn't already know, you certainly know from the thumbnail behind me now and the intro graphic of this uh, video. Kyler Murray pulled the upset and won the Heisman Trophy last night, upsetting Tua Tagovailoa and Dwayne Haskins of Ohio State. Now, Haskins, I didn't feel like was really that much in the running to be completely frank with you. He had a phenomenal season, but it felt like a two two horse race this whole time. And really it took until the final week of championship championship Saturday effectively to crown who the Heisman Trophy winner was going to be because Tua had it pretty much the entire way it felt like. I I had long since given up hope for Kyler winning. In in all honesty, I had because you know Baker Mayfield Last year, he broke the all-time efficiency record, and it was like, wow, that might stand for a while. Well, turns out not one, but I know for a while, too, was beating it. I think when you factor in his championship Saturday, maybe he just narrowly missed it. But if he didn't also surpass Baker's efficiency record, he's just a hair behind it. So phenomenal season from that dude. Phenomenal season from all three candidates. This was a three-quarterback uh, Heisman vote. I think only the third time that's happened in the modern era where all the candidates were uh, quarterbacks in this case. Uh, the previous one I can think of was Colt McCoy, Sam Bradford, and Tim Tebow in 2008. Uh, Bradford took that one home as well, another OU guy. So, hey, there's a connection there as well. Uh, they, like to tell you, uh, they like to tell you that this is the first time that a school has won back-to-back -back since 1946, but that's not true. See, they might have taken Reggie Bush's Heisman away in 2005. Well, not in 2005, but his 2005 Heisman. They might have taken it away from him and taken his name out of the record books. But we know USC won back-to-back. -back. Leinert beat Peterson <coughs> in 2004. And then in 2005, Reggie Bush edged out Vince Young. That one, that one I kind of thought Young would get it. But you know what? Reggie Bush did have a season for the ages. And they probably got that one right. But it is what it is. Point being, this might be the first time it's been recognized since 1946, but it's definitely not the first time a school has got to watch their guy go up there and accept the trophy in back-to-back -back years. So, uh, Kyler gets the edge by 296 votes over Tua. And it's hard to say that this wasn't uh, the result of the SEC championship game. Tua gets injured early on in that game with his ankle, tries to play through it, gets injured again later to the point where he just can't play. They believe he'll be good for the Orange Bowl later this later this month, I think December 29th against Oklahoma uh, for the college football playoff. That will be interesting to see how he recovers. Um, but man, they got a capable backup even if he's not completely good to go. So, Tua in that game, in that SEC title game, that presumably is what cost him the Heisman Trophy. He went something like 10 of 24 or 26 for like 161 yards, one touchdown and two picks. Warrior for trying to fight through it, but unfortunate break for him. And you know what? Kyler shined. OU had one loss on the season on a neutral field to Texas by three, and Texas was a top 15 team. Uh, going into the championship matchup for the Big 12. So not only does OU avenge its loss and therefore solidify its place in the college football playoff, but Kyler shines in the Big 12 championship game. I mean, just beautiful performance from him. I want to say it was something like 24 of 35 uh, for, like, he had four touchdowns, something like that, something crazy. It's been a couple weeks, and I don't have the stats right up in front of me. Forgive me. But Kyler shined in that game. And the case that I made this entire lead up to the Heisman, and I, I wasn't sure that anyone was really going to listen to it, and I know I won't, I'm not the only guy who made this case, but Jalen Hurts in the SEC title game proved 
And Jalen Hurts had won 25 games as the quarterback before he got replaced for Tua, including the national championship game last year when Tua saved Alabama from losing to Georgia. That that dude, as good as he is, as good as Tua is, not only does he have the best weapons in the country, both offensively and defensively, to play with, but that team is a college football playoff like entrant, if not national champion, without him. Kyler, you take Kyler off of OU, they lose four to five games this year, especially after they lose uh, Rodney Anderson, star running back from last year in the second game of the season. They, they go from five running backs on the depth chart to two, I think, at this point. Kyler had to not only, in every passing category, match or exceed Tua, he had to also add another 800 yards and 11 rushing touchdowns on the ground. That couldn't be denied. If you're talking about, and it's another playoff team, it's not like you're talking about a three-loss team with phenomenal stats from its quarterback. If you looked at it as what one guy on one of the best teams, just by virtue of being a conference champion in the Power Five and being in the playoff, if you had to draw it down to the point of what one guy is most invaluable to his team, it was Kyler Murray. And there's, there's no arguing that. And you know what? Credit to Lincoln Riley as well. Let's acknowledge the fact that this is his second year as head coach. And not only does he have two Heisman Trophy winners, the first school ever, by the way, to have back-to-back Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks. But Lincoln Riley, here's his first two years as a head coach. 24-3 and record, those losses being to Iowa State, Texas, and Georgia. Two Big 12 championships, if you include his two years as offensive coordinator prior, he's got four straight Big 12 championships. Two college football appearances. Again, you add in his offensive coordinator stint. He's got a third one. Two Heisman Trophy winning quarterbacks. He's also had four finalists since he's been at OU in some capacity. The dude is unreal because you had D.D. Westbrook and Baker. You had Baker again as a runner-up, although in 15, Baker wasn't even invited to the ceremony. Then you had Baker win it. Now you had Kyler win it. Four finalists, three years. That is unreal. And that has got to be, if you're, OU obviously doesn't have much of a problem recruiting offensively. That has got to be your selling point every year for the next few years (laughs) in uh, the recruiting trails. It's like, hey, here's why you want to come play for me in Oklahoma. I can put, I have a good chance of putting you statistically in the Heisman finalists. You have a chance every year you come here. Four straight Big 12 championships, three college football appearances, college football playoff appearances. There's just something we can offer to you here no one else is able to offer. If you look at it this way, too, here's another incredible stat for Oklahoma. So in the last, this is over a 15-year span, there have been eight different quarterbacks who were opening day starters for OU. That's obviously because you had like three straight years where it was Baker, uh, you know, th- things of that nature. Two years where it was Trevor Knight. Of those eight quarterbacks over the last 15 years that were opening day starters, four of the eight won the Heisman. How is that for efficiency? And that's not all. That's not all uh, Lincoln Riley either. That's also that's also Bob Stoops with Sam Bradford. And, you know, it, it's it's unreal. Jason White as well, of course. It's unreal what they were able to accomplish at OU. And if, for the love of God, they can ever field a good defense, they would be the new Alabama. Or at least it would make for the greatest rivalry every year in the playoff or something like that. It would basically be like Alabama-Clemson right now being that it's going to be four straight years they match up they match up in the playoffs. So unreal, unreal stats there and season for OU. Um, let me see here, other notes. Basically, Kyler Murray is still going to go into baseball. I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in the draft, for the NFL draft, someone takes out a flyer on him just to own his rights. But if I'm Kyler, I still think I stick with baseball. Even though he showed, at least from an arm strength and mobility standpoint, he can do it. I still have questions about the physicality of the game and if he could endure at that level because athletes there are going to be bigger, stronger, faster 
than anything he's dealt with in college. And I had concerns coming into the season about him in college for a full season. And hey, he proved me the hell wrong. I didn't doubt that he had a cannon for an arm. I didn't doubt that his mobility would allow him to do something like rush for 600, 700 yards, even 800 as he did. But I had questions about his accuracy and just his ability to stay healthy with that more mobile running game that he likes to implement. And so that that's just how it all shaped up. I, I don't know what to make of it. I think that more than likely he goes just sticks with baseball. That's still his plan as far as I understand. But it'll be interesting to see for sure. So here's, here's some other notes here for the Big 12. This is just a quick side note. It's actually not OU related. Well, I guess there is a connection to OU in this case. But I saw that Will Greer of West Virginia will not play in their bowl game. So the senior quarterback, this is according to ESPN College Football, the senior quarterback announced his decision to sit out the Camping World Bowl against Syracuse on December 28th as he begins preparing for the 2019 NFL Draft. All right, fair point. I, I don't blame him for that because you certainly don't want to hurt your stock and you've got nothing to gain playing in that game. But now that means your last game you do play, the last little bit of tape you put out there is against Oklahoma, where, yes, you threw for more than 500 yards and I think four touchdowns in the game, but you had two critical fumbles that basically cost your team the game. Uh, not great to put out there, but at the same time, I get it, dude. You got to protect your stock, and somebody will take out a flyer on Will Greer. I think he's probably a mid-round uh, draft pick and probably worth taking a look at. I don't know his ability to translate at the next level, but I think in this day and age, you see, you do see, and you're going to continue seeing a lot more of these college athletes say, you know what, if I'm not in the playoff, not worth it. Like, it's really not. It's an exhibition. It, it could be West Virginia against, uh, what would be another good team? Michigan. It could be West Virginia versus Michigan or versus Wisconsin or LSU. It could be something like that. And if I'm Will Greer, I'm still saying, yeah, no, still an exhibition. Means nothing to me at this point. And uh, going against a team like that, I can only put up more harmful tape for me. I don't think he's worried about Syracuse in terms of harmful tape. I think he's worried about it in terms of, yeah, I just don't want a freak play to happen and suddenly I, you know, injure myself and now I have very little draft stock. Don't Don't want to risk that. Don't blame the kid at all. But uh, enough of West Virginia football talk here. This is uh, this is going to be interesting, the subplot now moving forward. This is pivoting back, by the way, to the Orange Bowl. Uh, this is going to be an interesting subplot. Obviously, them moving it. This game was originally slated to be at AT&T Stadium in Dallas. Well, excuse me, in Arlington. And basically, they moved it. They flipped it with the Orange Bowl because they looked at it and they're like, well, Alabama is the one seed and Oklahoma is two-hour drive from Arlington to maybe at most three hours, depending on where you're exactly coming from in Oklahoma, as opposed to Alabama being, I don't know how many hours away, but way more. So basically it would have been like a home game for OU instead. And they basically said, nah, you got to favor the, the one seed in this case. That's that's what they've earned. And so they flipped it, putting Oklahoma in the Orange Bowl and moving Clemson-Notre Dame to AT&T Stadium instead. Uh, that, that sucks. I, I don't know that I would have gone to the game, but if it was here in Arlington, it would have been really tempting to at least try uh, to try and get in. But not going to happen now. I get why. But I don't know. OU's had a lot of – if you look at OU's history, it's got a lot of – a lot of good uh, memories at the Orange Bowl, although it hasn't been as kind to it in recent years. 2015, they went back to the Orange Bowl. It didn't work out, I think, against Florida uh, in the 2008 National Championship, which, again, even though Florida was a two-seed, they basically got the one-seed because back then you didn't flip-flop this and adjust it based on what favored the one-seed. The location was the location. Uh, that was also at the Orange Bowl, and now... I think there was even one more instance of it. Since 2000, when OU won its last national championship at the Orange Bowl, I feel like they've had three return trips, and none of them have worked out well for OU. So uh, hopefully they can buck that trend. But, man, they're going to have to hang half a 100 on Alabama 
And uh, there was some comment someone made. I can't remember if it was Paul Feinbaum. Uh, you know, he's obviously so in his SEC bubble, he, he refuses to acknowledge or believe anything else outside of that. But it was one of those talking heads and basically made the comment that if OU wants to win this game, they're going to have to drop 50 on Alabama. And as RJ Young pointed out on Twitter, so you're saying they have to score their season average? Okay. <laughs> like they've shown they can do that all year. It's not like you're talking about an offense that scores 35 then saying, hey, if you want to beat Alabama, you got to put up, you know, at least nearly or nearly twice your average. They're not saying that. They're just saying you got to put up your average. Okay. Yeah. It's against Alabama and that's going to be tough, but I think the offense could do it. I, again, I have some concerns uh, with the physicality of it uh, and how that could impact Kyler because Kyler is the most crucial piece to the offense. Their receiving core is amazing. Obviously, you got to see what the health situation looks like for Hollywood Brown uh, as he deals with his foot injury. Hopefully, he's able to return. The belief right now seems to be that he will return. And you have CeeDee Lamb as well. I think they're the first pair of OE receivers in one season to both go over 1,000 yards was what I saw, or maybe it was like 1,200 or something like that. But it was something interesting where I was like, wow, you know, as much as we've been a spread offense since 99, 2000, the fact that we don't have that accolade prior is kind of amazing. But OU's receiving core is amazing. Very, very good depth, very good quality. And, you know, even in the Big 12 championship game against Texas, you saw that. You didn't just see, I mean, obviously I'm including Calcaterra in the tight end position here, but you saw Tees, uh, you saw Baskins and uh, Basquin, sorry. I mean, you saw these other guys making plays that aren't aren't superstars. Lee Morris has certainly been a touchdown machine all year. Kyler's from a former high school teammate. But it's just interesting to to look at. The one thing that concerns me, other than the obvious defense, Although they've been opportunistic lately, and even last year they did that as well. And then in the Rose Bowl they had that strip sack, or not strip sack, it was a fumble on Chubb, I want to say, and then they returned it like 48 yards for a touchdown um, in the Rose Bowl. But other than the obvious concerns about the defense, I do have concerns as well with running back. You obviously have Kennedy Brooks, who's averaging like 11 yards a carry this year, which is insane. But you don't have a whole lot beyond him. Like they're, they're beat up and that's why Kyler has had to run as much as he has. And as good as he is, if you can bottle him up and limit his damage, like Texas did for most of the uh, big 12 or sorry, not big 12 championship game for the first quarter and a half, they did a pretty good job bottling him up. But for the red river rivalry in October, if you can keep him bottled up and contained, let alone if you can trick him into a mistake or two, it's going to be a long day for OU, so we'll see. I might do one more show uh, right before the Orange Bowl just to kind of preview that, and then after all the bowl games and the college football playoff has been decided, or rather after OU has been either either has advanced or been eliminated, however that works out, I'll probably do another one to just kind of sum up all of the bowl games for the Big 12 and go from there, but... That's going to do it for my time on this show, guys. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Again, if you if you want to see more of this college football talk, I'm more than happy to give it to you. Uh, we just got to share, this, share these videos, kind of grow this little particular show, this little brand that we're building up. And, you know, if we have the audience, we'll be able to we'll be able to keep doing it and implement it in all throughout the next season and you know, moving forward in the future. In addition to the Mavericks talk, the Cowboys talk and all that other stuff we do as well. So. Until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.